don't know if you want to start with the two commitments. I'm gonna I'm gonna give the floor to you. You you drive this car. Yeah. So besides it being um, cold as hell, I think it was a pretty successful uh, junior day. Um, obviously, it was great that Texas won the basketball game as well. Uh, the whole <laughs> Texas recruiting media market pretty much was making jokes the whole morning about how they were going to get run off the floor, but they won. So great, great news. Um, who, uh, who who called that win on Saturday, by the way? There was a certain member of the Horns 24-7 staff, I think, that mentioned. Yeah, no idea. Text. No, I <laughs> Mentioned in the group text that they had a good feeling. Because usually that's the kind of game that Texas messes around and wins after uh some struggles so yeah I'd, i had a good feeling about it jordan i don't know what it was but man it couldn't from that standpoint <clears throat> good atmosphere for the game top 10 opponent you get a win it was great for rodney terry couldn't have worked out better for sark though yeah um they obviously got two commitments uh racing gillery and lance jackson both kind of a little bit out of the blue um lance jackson was someone we were expecting to end up at texas eventually but you know, honestly, not this soon. Um, he had always talked about wanting to take the official visits first. Um, and with him, it, you know, it's well documented who his older brother is, Landon Jackson, the Arkansas defensive end, who is top 50, top 70-ish prospect in the 2021 class. When he came out of Pleasant Grove, same high school Lance was at. Um, so Lance has kind of been getting recruited since like his, his sixth, <laughs> seventh grade year, uh, just because Landon started getting recruited really early on in his high school career. And Whenever you go and visit, you usually bring your siblings. And Lance, I mean, he's built and looks just like Landon almost. Um, yeah. And so, you know, schools could see even then when he was 12, he, he was going to be a guy in the future. So it was a long process for him. And he always talked about how, you know, he's kind of just sick and tired of it. Because, um, again, he kind of had two or three years longer in terms of getting recruited than the other kids in this class. So. He, he always went about it professionally kind of because he had been through it before. Um, mm -hmm. And so he had always said he wanted to take the OVs first and then commit after, but he'd always said that he wanted to take OVs as soon as possible. Uh, and usually they open the last weekend of April, and he already knew that. So he was always saying, I want to take my first OVs the last weekend of April and, like, commit by the end of May. Um, so when I was talking to him, uh, we got some quotes before he went ahead and announced it. Um, I asked him, you know, was this a spur of the moment decision or, you know, did you kind of go into this visit? Maybe you're thinking about it on the drive, you know, I'll commit. And he had said, you know, he knew Texas was a place for him, but he wasn't really expecting to commit. And then he got on campus and kind of was just like, man, this is where I'm going. I might as well, <laughs> I might as well just post it. Um, that was kind of his mindset. And, you know, I, I wrote in the stampede this morning how, you know, I think he's going to be really solid to his commitment, uh, kind of just because of everything yeah. I said where, man, he's tired of this process. He knows what his different options are. And, you know, also he, he's been to Arkansas a ton. And I think I believe he's been to Tennessee twice. I know he went once in November. Uh, I believe it was like a whole weekend unofficial. Um, so he he's seen, and the reason I brought up Arkansas and Tennessee, those are the two schools that are really the only competition to Texas, I'd say. And I think Lance would say the same thing. So it was important that he got to see those two programs um, and get an in-depth view with them before he went ahead and committed to Texas because, you know, he's also seen Texas a lot. And it just means he's seen all the options, I think, that could come along. And he pretty much already has every offer in America. So, you know, I expect him to be pretty firm on his commitment. Um, and then racing Gillery, that one was really uh, kind of out of the blue there. Um, I believe I'm actually <laughs> – I believe before he committed, uh, I was the only person that had ever interviewed him. Um, I talked to him after Alito had won the state championship game. Uh, it was actually it was on my birthday, December 15th, um, last month. They had won racing, didn't play uh, because he had hurt – I believe he tore his MCL or PCL. It was something of the two. I, I can dig for that. I have it somewhere. but. Yeah, uh, he got hurt in the fourth or fifth round, missed the state game, wanted to be a part of the team. So the Alito coaches let him suit up. He obviously didn't play, though, but interviewed him, then talked to him. And, um, you know, he had sent him and Tashar Choice for talking every day. And, they, you know, he was high on – he didn't say directly Texas is my favorite school, but, you know, whenever you talk to kids, you can – whenever you do this for a living, you get a good sense of reading, you know, body language and, yeah. you know, just tone of voice, stuff like that. and. I could tell he really did like Texas, but, I mean, he said he'd barely visited anywhere and was looking forward to seeing Texas more because at that point he'd only been for the Wyoming game. Um, and then comes this weekend for junior day. It's funny. 
I mean, basically the way we got to operate work in these junior days is we're in the parking lot as they get off buses. And some of these buses will have like a lot of guys on them. And Racing yeah. Guillory was on a bus with like Riley Pettijohn and Deuce Williams and some other big time guys. So no one actually no one talked to him. Um, and then, you know, if some time goes by. We get word that his grandpa's posting on Facebook to see yeah. everyone else. <laughs> um, we run it by Texas because, you know, we, Hank and I both talked to Texas sources going to the weekend. You know, any yeah. guys maybe I'll feel good about and. They, didn't, they, they honestly said they weren't expecting any, anyone to commit. Um, but if it was going to be some commits, it was going to be these guys. Racing Guillory wasn't one of those names. So, you know, we checked back with Texas like, hey, uh, you know, what's going on here? And they're like, yeah, he he committed. Uh, the staff loves him. And they're really excited for his commitment. And uh, I head up Racing Guillory like, what's up, man? <laughs> uh, heard the news, you know. And we did our interview, knocked it out, got the graphic made, and he went ahead and posted it. Um, he he would have posted it while he was on campus, but he was waiting on his graphic to be made. And that's why it ended up getting posted at past 9 o'clock or whatever time it ended up airing. But that's uh, pretty much the backstory, I guess, behind this weekend's two commitments. Okay, let's start with, let's start with Lance Jackson. We've got him listed as a defensive lineman. Uh, did you get a, a – a, an updated weight for him because the six, five in the link part, that's pretty self-explanatory with him, but where is he weight wise right now? Cause I wonder, is he on his, on a path to being an interior D lineman or might he have to be an edge guy? Uh, he look, honestly, he can do either one. Um, okay. What Tex has been talking to him at, I mean, PK has been his primary recruiter this whole time. Um, and they've also, you know, pretty much since Ethan Burke came on, they've been saying, that's who we want you to be. So that's kind of the the path Texas has been kind of envisioning, Matt. They haven't said directly, you know, you're going to come here and play that exact role, but writing's kind of on the wall, and Lance has even talked about, like, you know, what are you looking for, or what do you like about how Texas recruits you? And he said uh, he sees a lot of similarities with himself and Ethan Burke, and, you know, he, he could envision himself being in his shoes one day. Um, and so that's kind of where I see him ending up positional fit. But, you know, again, uh, 245, I'd say he's probably heavier than that. Okay. Uh, but with, with this frame, he could he could get up to 280. Honestly, you know, if things go his way and he ends up being an NFL draft prospect, he'll probably end up being drafted at least above 270 for sure, I'd assume, no matter what the position is. Because, um, again, that's the type of athlete and the type of frame he has. He can do that. So, And I wrote this in – I believe the comments under his commitment story, but him committing this early is good for Texas because this gives them flexibility. While they've talked to him about being in Ethan Burke's shoes, him committing this early gives them flexibility where, you know, say they whiff on some D-line guys, you know. Yeah. Unfortunately, that could possibly happen. Mm -hmm. Lance can play D-line and they can go take, you know, an extra edge to where class numbers make more sense. So him shutting it down this early helps Texas in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I I I liken him from a body type standpoint. Uh a little bit like he he's thicker than Ethan Burke, right? Uh yeah. Reminds me kind of not a little bit, a little bit different, but, but kind of in the same mold of like Taquan Graham. Like when Taquan Graham was at Temple, he was in that kind of two, two fifty-five, two sixty range. I didn't think Taquan Graham would be a guy that got up to like three hundred plus pounds, but he did at Texas and ended up being a productive interior D lineman and ended up getting drafted. I, I think anytime you take edge guys, if you can bulk them up and kick them inside and they maintain the same level of explosiveness that they have, the ability to penetrate and get up the field, I'm all for it, man. I, I think Byron Murphy showed you this year the importance of having a penetrator and a disruptor at defensive tackle. It's like as good as Moro Ojimo and Keandre Coburn were in 22 – Neither one of those guys was really a disruptor like that. But with Murphy and Sweat, you you know, Byron was the disruptor. And then, okay, if you're going to double team Byron Murphy, well, good luck blocking Tavondre Sweat one on one. That's what made those guys so good as a tandem. So, I, yeah, I'm all for it. As long as, as long as you can bulk them up, like I said, and they can maintain the athleticism, that's fine. Well, the racing Guillory, Jordan, anytime people hear the phrase Alito running back, Everybody thinks of Jonathan Gray, and everybody thinks, man, how much tread is this guy going to have on his tires by the time he gets to campus? You've seen him 
should that be a concern at this point, or you think it's just way too early to to know? He's got he's got two more years of, of varsity football left. Yeah, um, honestly, not worried about it. Uh, I mean, he's been he originally was at Mansfield Lake Ridge as a freshman, uh, where he was their varsity running back for the ten games they played. They didn't make the playoffs. Um, I believe it was seven hundred ish rushing yards he had as a freshman, something like that. Mm-hmm. Transfers to Alito has to sit out. I think it was their first three games, and then he missed their state game and their semifinal game because he only played in, I believe, eleven games as a sophomore. And yeah, since Alito made it to state, they would have played in sixteen games. So uh, he missed five of them. Um, and honestly, no, I- I'm not worried about carries for him. At least you know through his first two years, uh, Alito this this season they had. I'm probably going to butcher his name. I believe it was Kieran Hawk Daniels uh, was his name and. They they traded carries, even though, like, Racine was the workhorse. He led them in all rushing uh, stats and everything like that. You know, he wasn't overworked. Alito's going to run through everyone in that district, and really he won't have to play full four quarters outside of non-district and, you know, once you get to the third, fourth round of the playoffs. So not necessarily worried about tread on the tires for him. Also, with Jonathan Gray, like, people have to realize how many carries Jonathan Gray was getting at Alito. Like, that it was a ridiculous number. Yeah. Like yep. ridiculous. Like it's like Kansas and Deontay Foreman that game. Except like <laughs> he gets like six games a year like that, and he plays sixteen games because Alito was winning everything back then as well. So. Yeah, um, I think the uh, you know the way Jonathan Gray got used, and I don't blame Tim Buchanan or anybody on the Alito staff for the way they used him, but you've got to think too. He won three straight three straight state championships. So he's playing 15, 16 games a year. I liken it to where it kind of reminds me kind of how I've thought about Kevin Durant in recent years. Jordan, like you look at KD's age, like, okay, he still should have tread on the tires. But you think about the playoff runs that he had with with Oklahoma City and with Golden State, the international play that he played, whether it's uh, the FIBA World Championships or the Olympics, like Kevin Durant's in his mid-30s. Kevin Durant's probably 34, 35, but that's an old 34 35 like he's that's a broken down that's a lot of tread on that on those tires so yeah i I, you know i've seen high volume carry guys uh malcolm brown was a decently high volume carry guy in high school and you know battled injuries one year at texas but played his four years at texas and up until this season as a matter of fact yeah was he in was he in the league this year i think maybe it was last year where he, you know, that he got a call from the Rams because he, Sean McVay loves him. The Rams need a running backs and they call Malcolm Brown. Like one week, I remember Malcolm was asking people, Hey, what's a good tailgate to attend? Cause I'm ready to go to a game as a fan. And then literally the next week, the Rams signed him to a free agent deal and he's playing in the NFL the following Sunday. So, uh, yeah, I, it, yeah, anytime you mention Alito running backs, you know, you're going to have to hear that for the next couple of years with Guillory. So just, or, or you got your mind wrapped around it. Like, are you ready for it? Are you ready for people to just, hammer you with the racing Guillory questions about how many carries is he getting? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm excited though. Cause I've been meaning to get out to Alito. Um, I knew I was going to see him at state this year and I didn't, so I didn't really make a huge effort, but uh, I, I got to get out there at some point, obviously now racing's committed, but also uh, Caden Finley's there and Caden Finley's a 2026 kind of jumbo wide receiver, maybe a Y uh, and he's your Michael Finley's son. And, Yes, he is. Your Michael Finley, you know, statistically being the greatest Texas tight end of all time, you know, his son's going to be pretty good at football. And you're going to assume that and, you know, you assume correctly. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing both of those guys.